All right. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, geosynchronous spacecraft opportunity uh, that has been developed here recently for us to fly a hosted payload on a geosynchronous spacecraft. This hosted payload will operate in the amateur satellite service. Uh, it will be operated by AMSAT, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, and the development for it is being done uh, using Gudu Radio. And we've had some extremely fortunate circumstances which are going to allow this to be possible. And uh, let me go from there. So this is a joint effort between Virginia SAC, uh, Virginia Tech, AMSAT, well, I'm going to run the two together, Virginia Tech and AMSAT, and uh, 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 to put a payload on a spacecraft being designed by Millennium Space Systems in El Segundo, California, for the United States Air Force. And it's the United States Air Force Wide Field of View mission. So I was working on a different project as the director of research of the Hume Center. I have lots of research projects that I uh, uh, manage while uh, all my students and public folks, they get to do all the work that I get to manage them. So anyway, uh, the, I was walking through the Millennium's factory on a tour, and I happened to see a spacecraft. And I went, having, I've, you know, I've, had, I've had a long and interesting career. I had a very successful career with the United States government, and I had a long history with AMSAT. And then in 2006, I made a terrible mistake. I became vice president for engineering for AMSAT. And it was a bad time. We couldn't find launches. Uh, we had lost lots of volunteers, and I was not very good at being a manager. So uh, we did not succeed in getting the geosynchronous payload launch that we had designed. And I'll tell you a little bit about the payload and how we might succeed this time. Okay. So uh, this concept was developed by Matt Ettis, who is into MJI, uh, me, Eric Blossom, K7GNU, and Frank Brickle. AB2KT at what was either the first or the second ever hat test in Reno, Nevada, when I was uh, employed by the Institute for Defense Analysis, a Center for Communications Research in Princeton, New Jersey. And Frank and I were both employed there at the time, but both of us were just big old hands. We were ham radio operators. And Eric was at the time the director of Google Radio, and Matt was, I think, transitioning off the USRP-1 uh, on to the next generation. So this was very early days in new radio, and we were not ready even if we had succeeded because lots has happened. Lots of, lots of good things have happened in uh, technology, including RFICs and very dense FPGAs and um, FPGAs married with ARM processors, and these things have dramatically changed. So maybe my failure was a good thing because now I think we actually can succeed. Uh, so uh, uh, rideshare ideas were initialized. These rideshare ideas were initialized by Tom Clark. He was a very long baseline interferometry uh, guru at Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, I was, had taken some of his ideas for a project I was doing at work. Uh, and at the same time we were wishing we could get a geosynchronous spacecraft, he was on a board of directors of the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, AMSAT, and he came up with this concept called CC Rider, which I'm not going to go into the details, but CC Rider was a cutesy name that Tom made up for the payload we wanted to do, and we were trying to get it done, and we hacked our way around at uh, Eric Blossom's house and had some good ideas, let me go over. So when I was walking through Millennium, I saw this big cube. Uh, and that is immediate. Every alarm in my head went off. I saw all the antennas are on one side of that spacecraft, and almost the rest of the thing has empty spaces on it. And I can see these wings that are going to fold out, and they're spearable wings to be these solar panels. And I built these spacecraft, so I, I was kind of recognizing what I'm seeing. This had to be a geosynchronous bird. And it uh, had a fair amount, of, even though it looks crowded, it actually has a lot of space on what is called the nadir pointing face. 
That means that face is always pointed at the center of the earth. And you want to be on that nadir pointing face, pointing at the earth if you're a geosynchronous, so you put a good antenna on it. And I took one look at it and I said, that's a geosynchronous payload, and you've got a lot of nadir pointing faces available there. I got pity. And I said, I said, well, I want to know how much excess power, how much excess mass, and how much it will cost to put a ride share payload on there. And they went, okay. And uh, gave me back a number, which was unbelievable. They will give me 140 watts, 20 kilograms of mass, and they'll only charge me $5 million to take the thing up and run it for a decade. I mean, this is like, I couldn't believe it. Intel Sat wanted 60 something million dollars to do the same thing in 2007 when we tried before. And I'm like, wow, what else has changed? So at the same time I was here, we were working with uh, another partner in the project we were doing uh, at Millennium. This partner happened to also be a ham. And that partner is well known to anybody who was ever around Tapper in the early days. It was Mike Parker, who founded a company called Rencon. He is KT7D, for those of you who are amateur radio operators. And in the community I come from, Mike Parker is, he is a uh, worship like a super, superhero. And I went, oh, I, I can use this though to help me get this stuff on here. And he started the company in the early days with the Tapper people. And the company is called Rencon. And Rencon is still in operation in Tucson, Arizona. And they have developed some very interesting software-defined radios not unlike the E310. Vertex 7, ARM on the park, RFICs from analog devices, but Mike has gone a step further. He's put it in a box and he took it to Brookhaven National Labs and he irradiated this box so powerfully that in about six more months we'll be able to hold it in our hand without getting cancer. <laughs> because the thing is radioactive. He put 125k rad on this on this radio and it continued to work without a single, single event upset latch up. Uh, they have SEUs, but you have to build these things to survive. SE single event upsets. Up. That means a particle hits it and flips a bit in a register or a memory of those things. That's called an SEU in, in, in aerospace lingo. And it, the thing was so hard, but an SEU latch up is where that permanently happens. So a memory cell gets corrupted in memory or register or some device, it permanently changes to a permanent bit state and can never be toggled again. That's a bad thing. So there are no SEU latch-ups in the test of this thing. And he went, I'll donate our software defined radio and all of our software for that device. And I went, well, that's a lot, that's great, Mike. He says, I've got to do a lot of protocol work because we're going to be doing some stuff. So let me go over how this is going to work. So let me give you some characteristics on the uplink, downlink, the physical layer, the access method, downlink parameters, and uplink parameters. Okay. So the thing's going to operate. Well, you're going to talk to the spacecraft 5.6 uh, gigahertz band. The amateur radio service has a subservice or, or a complementary service called the Amateur Satellite Service. The Amateur Radio Service and the Amateur Satellite Service are both governed by the Federal Communications Commission Regulations Part 97. You need to be a ham radio operator to use this device as you do any device where you're going to transmit in the amateur radio bands. So if you have a ham radio ticket of any type in the United States, you can operate the spacecraft and also uh, other countries, Canada, Mexico, etc. Okay, so in the 5 gigahertz band, that's our band, and we're going to try to get a 10 megahertz wide transponder going up to it. The uh, downlink is in the 10 gigahertz band, and it uh, we will again have about 10 megahertz. It might be slightly wider, and I'll explain that a little bit to you as I go along. The uplink will be frequency division multiple access. PSK, and I'm going to use PSK for one reason, one reason only. It's easy to make 
the uh, transmitter uh, and amplifiers are efficient. Those are a constant envelope that I can make nonlinear as the dickens and still get the thing up. So, uh, same thing on the downlink, except this will be time division multiple access. So, I'll have a bunch of parallel channels going up and I'll sequence the downlink all one after the other and I'll have some pictures drawing this so you can see it when, when it's pictorially if you uh, need pictures. So the access method will be Trump Mobile Radio Light. So in the TDMA downlink, there'll be a map. And the map will say these channels are used or these channels are unused. And the map will also say this, the person in channel 10 is in communication with the person in channel 20. Or the person in channel 10 is available but not talking to anyone. Or you can go to an empty channel, uh, look for an empty channel, and say, uh, uh, you can call, calling anyone. Okay, so you will pick an empty channel and transmit in that empty channel. And the system will recognize that you're requesting access to the satellite, and you're either calling anyone, calling someone specific, or asking to join an existing conversation. So that's how it works. Trump Mobile Radio Light. That protocol work needs to be done. And so I'm going to tell you how we're going to get that Trump radio to work underway and done. That is a lot of power for 10 gigahertz. So it'll be 17.5 degree half power beam with antenna, and we're going to pump 30 plus watts. Our designer thinks we can get up close to 40 watts and still be well under the power budget. The spacecraft will not have trouble getting to your antenna about that wide. Okay, and we'll have low noise amplifiers and a phase array on the uplink uh, on the spacecraft. And I will show you how that's going to be fit on the spacecraft in a minute. Okay. Okay, so this is the same on this quickly because I have a feeling this, oh shoot, sorry. Yeah, this will be slightly less interesting to many of you. Many of you know that we've done these analog transponders in the past, uh, where we put multiple single sideband signals or Morse code signals or other signals in a single transponder and it linearly uh, transponds them to the ground. So given the way I'm going to do the receiver on the spacecraft, this will be very, very easy to accomplish, and I'll explain to you how that will be accomplished as I go on. And then I'll have a single horn with a single amplifier on it, and it will be linear, and I will transmit those that block of frequencies down through the separate antenna in a linear amplifier, a handful of watts to the ground. So it'll be a bent pipe. It's called a bent pipe linear transponder. What goes up will come down. Now, there's a lot, uh, even with the slow moving spacecraft, there's a lot of dot work on uh, between you caused by the relative velocity between you and the spacecraft. So a typical trick that we've always used, that many of us have used, is to have the spectrum inverted. So if a signal is low in the uplink, it'll be high in the downlink. So if I transmit upper sideband in the uplink, it'll come back lower sideband in the downlink. And the net doppler is the doppler of one minus the doppler of the other, rather than the doppler's sum. So the difference is a lot better than the sum, and that's how we minimize the Doppler ship on the signals you will see. It's called an inverting transponder, so that's what we'll do. And you can go read this stuff, so I'm not expecting you to learn all this if I'll get up here doing it. But we can do some tricks that make it easier. So uh, the wide field of view mission is a geosynchronous spacecraft with an inclination of between 4 and 8 degrees. Now what does that mean? If you have a geostationary spacecraft where they spend billions of dollars on fuel and attitude control mechanisms, you take your direct TV antenna, you shove it into the ground, you peak it up with a signal meter, and you go watch for the next two or three years. This will not do that. The, that orbit will be slightly inclined to the equator, and it will paint a figure eight on the sky. So uh, we can do this, you can go do, do your, your ground station in one of two ways. You can have a weak signal transmitter and steer a gain antenna, or you can have a smaller antenna that will cover that whole figure eight and turn up the power. So you can turn the power up and have a tiny antenna, or steer the antenna and turn the power down. 
And see, if I were going to have a handheld device that I wanted to operate off of batteries, I would steer the antenna to maximize the battery power. But we are not going to decide how that would work. You will decide that for yourself. What we're going to do is make recommendations for easy, inexpensive equipment that will do the low power, cheap way where you're steering the antenna by hand, and then you can do it some other way after that. So the sub-satellite latitude will vary uh, when they are going to operations. So there is a payload in the spacecraft, which uh, is, uh, let's call it an Earth sensor. And when I want to use this Earth sensor, if I'm the United States Air Force, on occasion, the thing I want to apply the Earth sensor to is nowhere near the United States. So the spacecraft will drift around the Earth, the instrument will be used, and then we'll drift back, go under control, and come back to nearly exactly the same place on the sky. So almost the entire time the spacecraft is in orbit, it will, it will be at 74 degrees west. It will be at subset longitude, 74 degrees west. What does that mean? So uh, as I said, there'll be infrequent times when it spends time away, and the mission will be about a decade long, and they've funded mission for three years. Now, uh, when I tell you why we're doing this payload and what I think will happen, I don't believe it will end in, in the three years, and I'll explain why. Okay. So as I've said, we're doing an expand power amplifier for a few bricks, so about between 30 and 40 watts. Uh, we know that we, uh, we, have a, we have a really serious RF uh, power uh, desire. It's Mark Franco, who works in of the power industry, the power amplifier industry with microwave devices, and he is the designer of the power amplifier. So if we have multiple, say four antennas on the transmitter and one of the bricks dies, then we have redundancy. So we're trying to figure out how to do this so we can steer the antennas a little bit, allow for some redundancy so that we keep the design simple because we don't have time to test this for years and years and years. We've got to take, a, we've got to take some risks. So uh, the design work is in the hands of Mark Franco, who for you hands is November 2 uniform officer into the UO. And the X-band bricks will be used on other AMSAT missions. Uh, uh, just let me quickly uh, give a plug. Uh, how many of you know uh, what Oscar 10, 13, and 40 are if I said they're EOs? Okay, so you may or may not know that we started a design for another EO, and it's called Phase 3E. And Phase 3E was stopped in its tracks in 2006 when the United States State Department told us that all of us who were working on it were in violation of ITAR, and we could be subjected to millions of dollars in fines or, and or prison, and people like me would lose their security clearance, so they would lose their day job. So as you can imagine, we all stopped working on it. Okay. So this spacecraft has been sitting in a closet uh, in Germany for uh, almost, oh, for over a decade. So I went to the United States government, to an entity that regularly launches spacecraft, and on occasion, they launch spacecraft into that particular orbit. And I said, I have a spacecraft in which there's a rocket motor and a tank and all this other stuff that I would love to never have to fire this rocket motor ever again. Uh, but in fact, I'd love to take the rocket motor out and in place of the rocket motor, put anything in it you want tested, and I will test it for you. I can prove to you that I can build and operate the electronics, attitude control systems, all that stuff on spacecraft, because I've done it on four of them, and we can work together. And I want a quick pro quo. You take me up, I'll test your stuff. And when I get to, when I send you my bill for my work, you will find that I'm 20 to 25 times cheaper than any big iron company you've ever paid to build a spacecraft. And they went, okay. So uh, I'm expecting that in 2018, uh, Phase 3E will be launched by the United States government. So that's not this story, it's another story, which you will hear in detail at the AMSAT meeting if you go. All right. So the ground terminal, look, here's some things we're looking for. Local size, weight, and power, antenna gain looks like an E3 on steroids with a bigger antenna, not one of Matt's LPDA, so it gets for Get Britain, uh, and an LNA, so you can hear this weak signal coming down from the spacecraft. Uh, we want it operated by battery, a couple 
small dishes so that you can get separation. Oops. Or not to. Okay, there we go. They went to sleep while I was looking. Uh, dual band feed is, is, is problematic. We may have to have two antennas. We're going to try to get a dual, dual band feed. Why does it keep going away? Ah, because I keep my plug in. Okay, all right, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm uh, technologically conflicted. <laughs> okay, so we're likely to need two antennas, one for the uplink and one for the downlink on the ground, so that we get sufficient isolation between the two, and they'll operate, because that's really hard. Because I can put out a lot of power, but I gotta listen to a really, really, really weak signal. And I'm gonna be pumping power up at five gigahertz, and listening at 10 gigahertz, I believe that we will find we will not be able to isolate the receive system, listening to a really, really weak signal from the extremely strong signal that will be transmitted a couple millimeters away. When the one over R squared is something that's a long way away, is 100, well over 100 dB. Okay, so I don't think that's going to work, but we'll, we'll try. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so we've got some, we have some test, test uh, uh, equipment that we think will work. So uh, you can use Cox TVRO uh, equipment for your 10 gigahertz receiver and um, a 0 0.6 to a meter direct TV dish. And uh, we, uh, many of you have, have gone to Dayton Hamvention or Friedrichshafen or one of these other places and seen these LMDs that you can go buy that are from, from, from a direct video broadcast that's stood out in Europe. Those things will work with this system. You can, they will work. Okay, so we're trying to make sure that you can use that stuff and do it inexpensively, or I'm sure that someone will, sorry, someone's gonna manufacture a device which will cost probably 20 times as much as this will cost, and, and you can have a nice, nice new pack. Okay, so uh, the Cox S uh, gear will work with the 700 megahertz. Any one of Matt's RFIC rigs is going to generate both the uh, transmit IF at 700 ish megahertz and the receive IF at 700 ish megahertz. We will work out the exact numbers later. And what we intend to do real tests right now on the ground with protocol and use the Matt's equipment, and I'll go over that in a minute. So, well, I'm not going over it right now. So there's major efforts in San Diego by Michelle uh, Thompson, 35 NYV, who's leading an effort there to design the ground terminal. And she has quite the history. Uh, uh, I've known her for a long time, worked with her for a while, when they even done to the failed geo mission. But Michelle, before that, was the, the, the system designer on major parts of handheld devices for a claw pump. So Michelle uh, has done quite well as uh, the engineer for Qualcomm, and she is now the chairman and the CEO and chief technical officer of her own company called Optimized Tom Foolery. So she does what she wants to with her time. And uh, I've talked to her into doing this, and she's very capable. Uh, in Virginia Tech, we have Zach and Tom. Tom is uh, now a member, an adjunct member of the faculty. And Zach Lefke was the, one of my, uh, my boys and you, a former student that was walking around with his uh, camouflage ball cap all week, all week if you've seen him. Okay, so we want high accuracy, high accuracy reference. A uh, 10 megahertz cone can be injected in the front of the system so we can back out, uh, transfer uh, on the system, keep everything lined up easily because I'm going to try to use narrow channels going up to the spacecraft and a wide band coming down, but I need something to make sure my narrow band channel lines up with a narrow band channel on the spacecraft. So I'm going to need to calibrate constantly the system, especially if we use the cheaper gizmos so that my transmitter sits in the middle of a receiver band that's on the spacecraft. I'll, it'll be easier to understand this when I get to the picture. So the same SDR, Matt's boxes or somebody will generate a five by six gigahertz uplink, and there it can be direct because his, say his RFIC uh, users and others, they will generate five by six, and then you run it in a power amplifier and out your antenna. Okay. 
So look, the FDMA digital uplink will have a number of uplink channels. These numbers will be determined by calculation. I'm going to say, here's the antennas I have on the spacecraft, here's how much gain they will have, here's the noise performance, the noise figure of the spacecraft into the system, and I'm going, to, I'm going to generate so much power, whatever it might be, on the ground in a typical ground installation. That number will go into a spreadsheet, and it will say, you can do this many channels. That has not been done. But we know we can generate quite a few channels, quite a few. I'd like for it to be close to 100, but we'll see. I'm not going to tell you what the number is today, but the number will be determined by the actual measured performance of the receiver that will fly and the power amplifier designs we get for the one for all the ground equipment under our preferred ground station design, and that will be the number that determines the number of uplink channels. Now look, suppose we're wrong. Suppose it will do 50 more or 20 less than we compute. What kind of radio are we flying? One person in an SDR conference got the right answer. It's a software defined radio, and I can change it. <laughs> okay. So, assume for now it's narrow PSK uplink carrying data, vocoder, picture, email, whatever. And the receiver structure for the FDMA signal is based upon POP. It's come from that channelizer design that Fred Harris and I have done and used in a number of projects. And uh, the, the base of tennis of Trump Mobile Radio will be used to manage the signals going into and out of the spacecraft. Uh, we're going to get past the words and get pretty pictures in a minute. Just hang on. So bandwidth will be limited by the required SNR. And assume for now, oh, this is a linear transponder. Assume right now that they will be about 50-ish kilohertz wide on the linear transponder. That's about what I'm expecting it to be. Maybe it'll be bigger, maybe it'll be narrower, but about 10 single sideband signals wide. That will support 50 to 100 uh, uh, single sideband conversations. I mean, you've been on 20 meters and listened to 300 to 350. That's a lot of conversations you can pack into 300 to 350 on 20 meters. This will be 20 meters all day long, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So I'm expecting a few more than you normally find on 20 meters to actually sign up and use it. That's when I hope they get sick of it and go over and do the digital transponder, where we'll have lots more capacity. Huh? We're going to light up, but they won't matter. If I have 20 signals and they're on top on top of each other, they can't be light up. I can't, I can't multiply. Coach Hamlin and Pierce Day is still a thing. Okay, so this current receiver structure for the FDM signal is bit pipe. And it's just exactly like Oscar 10, 13, and 40. Okay, but it'll, it'll use the digital structure. So this is like the channelized structure here. There's a shared bandwidth in an FDM uh, a system. And this is the, uh, the polyphase throwback channelizer design, which we've done, which uh, takes in high speed A to D and in mathematics on FPGA channelizes it. The other thing it does while it's doing this channelization is uh, it increases the dynamic range available in each channel by signal processing, and this is called processing gain. So if you thought you had a 12-bit A to D and the 12 bits was the most dynamic range you could get, you don't understand how the math works. You actually get gain by filtering and downsampling, and this gain will increase the dynamic range that's available in each one of the channels. So it's to be actually a very high performance receiver in this thing. And a TDMA down, so it's divided to everybody's signal comes at a different time in the downlink. So, so the first slot, in the time division downlink, this transmitter one, two, three, four, five. So uplink channel one will come down in time slot one. Uplink channel two will come down in time slot two. So the single carrier coming down, where the channel assignment on the frequency channel assignment on the uplink will correspond to the channel assignment on the downlink in time. Okay, so look, this is kind of a notional uh, view of what it looks like. It's fairly simple. So uh, this is the polyphase analysis matrix over here. This is the polyphase channelizer and just A to D sample running in on the left. 
and the thing block in the middle is where we will pop protocol. Uh, we will do the, the uh, you're requesting a channel, I'll assign you a channel. And then on the outlink, output of the protocol uh, uh, engine, I will resynthesize these into a single carrier on the downlink and uh, put, them, put them in time order. Uh, and so the data, this one and this one and this one and this one will all be synthesized into a single downlink and come down. And so in an FPGA, it's really easy to do, pull this off. And the, most of the protocol work is what will be done on the uh, general purpose processor because that's slow compared to the, uh, the actual digital database. Okay, so if I land at 74 West, which is what I have marked here, and illuminates the United States, this is the footprint. So uh, if you're in the Aleutian Islands, you're out of luck. Uh, if you are in the United States, uh, or all the way through Tierra del Fuego, you're in good shape. If you're in Europe or um, East Africa or Asia, you're out of luck. It's a geospacecraft. It basically sees a third of the Earth, and this is what our footprint will be almost all the time. You just did that to avoid so vain. That's it. <laughs> I, but, but, but the Germans are going to put one up over the Persian Gulf, and that's called. Uh, What's the name of that thing? Doesn't matter. The Germans are putting one up, or the Gunneries are putting up one for the Germans over that will do most of Europe and Africa. And so it can see Brazil and Mali and Algeria and so forth. So we're going to cross link them by Ismail. Ismail is what it's called. Whatever the Arabic word means. If somebody speaks Arabic here and knows my poor Arabic and can translate it, please do. I don't remember what it means. I should. But anyway, so we'll share ground stations in eastern Brazil or western Africa, and we'll cross-link between the two. So we will cover approximately two-thirds of the globe and almost the entire globe's population with two geo birds. Okay. Okay, so Colonel Fred Kennedy, the United States Air Force, is Air Force lead on the wide field of view mission. K8KA, Jeff Ward, formerly with USAT and Surrey Satellite Technologies, now works for a millennium. And he was a big time contributor to uh, Tapper and uh, Small Sats for us. Millennium is the integrator for wide field of view. Last but not least, Colonel Kennedy is not a ham, but he's a former student of Jeff Ward at the University of Surrey and who is now working at Millennium, and I begin, you probably begin to get the idea. It pays to have low friends in high places. <laughs> okay, so Millennium Space Systems, it gets better. Small company with Neil Segundo, with Stan Newman as chairman and CEO. Stan formerly ran Space Dev, which was uh, built a uh, chipset. Do we know anybody who worked on chipset? Yes, we do. Jan King was the former Vice President of Engineering for AMSAT. He worked for Stan Dubin at Space Dev. Bob Davis, former AMSAT Assistant VP of Engineering, he worked for Stan Dubin at Space Dev. So we all know Stan, who's the CEO of Money. So the project manager for the Air Force knows all of us. The, the head of Millennium knows all of us. And in the end, they said, yeah, you crazy hams, you can fly with us. We know you'll get it done. And we hope you will. So the opening picture that I showed you with the big box was taken at Millennium Space Systems. It gets better, as I've already mentioned this, but I'll go through it. So Rincon Research is a, man, it's a superb organization in Tucson. And uh, they have a professional software to find radio that they would like to donate to our mission. And why do you think they want to donate? They want flight heritage on their transceiver so somebody else will adopt the SDR and put it in their spacecraft. Believe me, there's always a reason behind these things. So Mike Parker is founder in KT7D, and he's an early member of Tapper with Tom and me, and Mike got most of his early workforce from Tapper itself. And they have donated their LPFD, which is low power front end, uh, for the wide field view effort. It's similar to the USERP E310. Most of the technology is identical. It's laid out differently. It has uh, uh, data paths protected by, order, by error correction. And so it's a space 
rated version of Max E310. It's what you all think about. It does not have a uh, an Ethernet cable coming out of it. It has other buses coming out of it. Oh, I'm technologically challenged. Okay, so they're also going to do, do, donate that SDR for the Phase 3D. All right. So this is Lake Dixon in Escondido, California. It is a uh, city park. And the people on the right, the low class person in the middle is me, and the high class people are KE6OID, Kathy Boyd, and Michelle Thompson is W5NYB. And we are all sitting uh, on top of a mount uh, where they have a big water tank for uh, Escondido. So they don't want us to put stuff on the water tank because they, they lease out the water tank top to T-Mobile. Doesn't matter. I'm standing on the ground taking this picture on the left and at Palomar Ridge in the far where I'm pointing with that arrow. Michelle is an officer in the Palomar Amateur Radio Club and operates and keeps their repeaters running for the Palomar Amateur Radio Club. And she talked them into letting us put an antenna and a pseudo transponder uh, in their shack and have the antenna up there like it was the spacecraft. And Kathy talked the Escondido Park Service into letting us play ground terminal and other stuff like this uh, at the Lake Dixon and that water tank. They don't, they don't let anybody near a water tank like that free and clear. There's a big fence and all sorts of stuff. I think you see, well, the fence looks pretty shabby, but it's actually pretty rough. Razor tape across the top, and not many people go up there. It's a, it's a hike, uh, and uh, we could, there's a telephone pole right about where that marker is on the Dixie site, and this is uh, Google Earth showing that the Dixie site is line of sight to power. We've talked Matt into donating equipment, and we will do the protocol development and other stuff here where I'm going to buy some kind of backhaul. If I have to, I'll buy 4G LTE backhaul from Verizon. I'm hoping to plug into their Ethernet or Wi-Fi or whatever. It doesn't matter. Whatever it takes, we will have backhaul in this. So we can program it remotely on occasion if we need to tell Kathy, run up there and reset the radio, or Michelle, who has a cabin on top of Mount Palomar. They can go do it. Okay, so we're going to do a lot of the development at these two places. Okay, so I want to take on balance. Okay, so he has a user B200. It's actually B210. But well, don't Matt's done that in B210, and we will be using it and another user would pretend like it's a transponder so that we can do uh, RF knock or other work and do the FPOPHASE filter bank channelizer or some version of it on board the FPGA and use it for the channelizer for the uplink. Okay, so I need to thank the Air Force, the American Radio Relay League, and I'll explain to you why in a moment. AMSAT, Millennium, Palomar Amateur Radio Club, Edis Research, Escondido, uh, California Parks and Recreation, the Human Center for National Security and Technology in all of Virginia Tech for putting up with me, and uh, FEMA. Now, why do, I, why do I want to care about FEMA? Why do I care about FEMA? Uh, <laughs> because the, uh, not because uh, Brownie still works at FEMA. No, no, I don't care about Brownie. I care about Craig Fugate. Who is Craig Fugate? Craig Fugate is the guy who is now the director of FEMA. And every day about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, if you're in Washington, D.C., a guy comes on the repeater and says, Hi, this is Craig. So uh, he was in Florida and ran the state uh, emergency management agency in Florida and ordered, he figured out pretty quickly you couldn't keep ham radio operators away from the disasters if you wanted to. So he figured out he would fold them into every emergency management office in the state of Florida and it worked really well for him. Uh, both uh, hurricanes, floods, sinkholes, whatever, it worked out before it really well in Florida. He has taken exactly the same set of feelings to Washington, but it's a lot harder to get stuff done, and it's certainly a lot harder to have a national plan when you don't have a single national asset. Ah. 
So the American Radio Relay League set up a memorandum of understanding with FEMA. And they have agreed to sponsor all of us to go and talk to Craig on September the 14th. On September the 14th at 10 a.m., I'm expecting Craig Fugate to write a letter of support for this endeavor and to order every FEMA field office in the country to begin to work with amateur radio operators who will use this to incorporate them in their nationally declared emergencies, such as earthquakes, hurricanes, fires that killed nine firefighters in Washington and many firefighters in California. They need this. They need it so badly, they don't know, and they've never known how to get it. And for a hand, uh, what to them is a handful of dollars, they can get it because you can't keep the hams out of a disaster area if you wanted to. I mean, 9-11 happened and 9-12, I was at IS-89 in New York City working for the Red Cross, communicating, uh, logistically keeping the firefighters and the police and all those stuff fed and water and clothed and a place to sleep. That's typical, completely typical of amateur radio operators. It works, and uh, Director Fugate would like to have an asset like this, and we're going to try to give it to him. Uh, the, uh, the, the first three years of uh, Whitefield View, if uh, the defense appropriation bill goes through and the thing gets finished, are, are paid for. But one national disaster. And with that spacecraft providing logistics and communication services that they've never, ever, ever been able to achieve before. And it will not have on that for your lifetime. That's my opinion. Nobody's promised that to me, but my opinion is politically, they will not be able to shut the thing off until they have a replacement. Okay. Any, I'm done. <laughs>